Okay, so what I want to talk about today is basically generative models for blank, where blank could be you know, vector graphics, graphic design layout, uh, animation, things that we haven't really talked about that people are applying generative models to, okay? And so this is gonna be basically just kind of like a whirlwind tour through a couple dozen papers that I found interesting, um, just to give you some sense that it's not all about ChatGPT, it's not all about stable diffusion, there are lots of ways that you can apply generative models to different problems, okay? And so um, let's kind of uh, get going. So the first thing I wanna talk about is basically, so generative models for fill in the blank, right? Uh, and so the first thing I wanna talk about is generative models for vector graphics. So, you know, you all know about stable diffusion and DALI for making, you know, what are called bitmap graphics or raster graphics, like pixels, right? However, if you're gonna make a graphic design like for a t-shirt or for a logo or something like that, you don't wanna have pixels because pixels are not easy to resize at any scale, right? And so if you're a professional illustrator or a graphic designer, you need what are called vector graphics. You know, basically, you know, pixel images don't cut it. You need to have something that is kind of infinitely scalable and looks good at any scale, right? And is, is sharp at any scale, basically. And so um, if you've ever done anything in like, this is kind of like the difference between Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop, right? Illustrator is what you use to make very sharp looking vector graphics. Photoshop is what you use for making great looking pixel images, right? Not that, and of course there are like open source alternatives to all these things, right? Um, and so, um, you may have heard of, for example, of like scalable vector graphics. Or SVG is a file format that you may came, come across for vector graphics, right? Certainly the native like Adobe Illustrator file is a AI file, that's a vector graphics file. You know, PDF stores, you know, the shapes of fonts and stuff like that as vector graphics. And so fonts are a great example of vector graphics, right? You can't have like, you know, Windows or whatever OS you're using doesn't store the graphics as like tiny bitmaps. It stores them as this kind of like renderable at any scale, you know, font, right? And so how do we represent those kinds of things, right? Well, you need to have some sort of like, it's almost like a programming language for specifying these open or closed curves, right? So for example, you may have, um, you know, suppose I wanna make something that looks like this and something that like curves around like this. And so, you know, if, if this is point number one, this is point number two, and this is point number three, you know, if you're drawing these things in like Illustrator, you know, oftentimes these things have like, you know, there's like these kind of like spline handles that you have to drag around that affect how does the curve kind of deform between here and here, that's what's called a Bezier spline or a B spline, right? And so to describe this shape, you know, what I need to do is I have to have like a primitive language that says like move to, you know, first I move my cursor to the point number one, and then I draw a line to point number two, and then I have a cubic Bezier curve that is kind of specified by, you know, point number three where I want to move to, but that also involves, you know, some extra points like point number four and point number five that give me the coordinates of these kind of like handles that I would drag around, right? And so you can think of a, you know, a font, for example, like here's maybe a better picture. Let's look here for a second. So here's kind of a picture on the left of how you might take a character in a font and create it by a bunch of control points that correspond to either points on the curve or points that are outside the curve that kind of specify how those Bezier curves smoothly go around, right? And so the advantage is that then we can take, you know, something like the six in the middle and we can draw it at any scale, right? And you compare that to how like a crummy kind of curve looks like this, this is not a very good representation of, uh, of a six because it's kind of got these kind of crappy gray pixels, right? And so um, luckily there's tons of training data, especially on things like fonts, right? So all the fonts on you know, Windows are vector graphics fonts. And so you can imagine you know, basically doing some sort of a training, except not on the bitmap, but on these kinds of instructions, right? That's kind of the, the input and the output of the generative model. 
And so an early paper actually was this one I was just showing here, this Lopez et al. ICCV 2019 paper actually was using this kind of like rep representation for vector graphics. And then they applied, like in this case, this is a VAE for learning the relationship between kind of like the character of the font that was kind of like conditioning. Okay, this is a six. And there was like the style of font, which is kind of like whether this is a Times New Roman six or a sans serif six or whatever, right? And so representing fonts in this latent space or representing these characters in this latent space then let you do all the things that you remember doing from the very beginning of class, right? Which is kind of like interpolating between, you know, the thin six and the thick six moving around in latent space. You can kind of make all these kind of like realistic sixes in between. Or conversely, you can find directions in latent space that correspond to kind of like changes in attribute, right? So for a font, it makes sense to say we could learn the direction that corresponds to boldening a character or italicizing a character or squishing a character or condensing a character, right? And so that was kind of like the beginning of the work in this area. This was 2019, so it was certainly VAE, you know, era, more or less. Um, and so let me just make come a couple quick notes on paper here. So the paper I just referred to was basically um, Lopez et al. in ICCV 2019. And then there were a bunch of other, you know, similar input output papers. There was a paper called Deep SVG, which was um, by Carlier et al. in NeurIPS 2020. There was a paper called M to VEC by Reddy et al. And that was in CBPR 2021. And then there was a vector specifically on fonts called Deep VEC font. Uh, Wang and Leon in SIGGRAPH Asia 2021. And so just to show you some, some pictures. So for example, you know, this top figure is from the Carlier et al paper, which is kind of more related to kind of like animating vector graphics. So the idea was that you start with something in the left-hand column of this kind of film strip, and then you have a target, which is your right-hand column, and then you kind of have a trip through latent space that naturally deforms the thing on the left into the thing on the right using these smooth, infinitely zoomable curves. And the illustrations from the bottom are from this ready paper on vector graphics, where again, you kind of are looking at like an interpolation or you can take a bitmap image, you can project it into the latent space of vector graphics and you can manipulate it that way. Um, and so when you have something that's a little more complicated like these emojis, basically every, cur every closed curve here is represented by a separate, you know, every piece of the emoji, like there's a vector curve for the yellow boundary, and there's two vector curves for the eyes and a vector curve for the mouth, right? And so this whole thing is represented by kind of like putting your pen down, moving it around, picking it up, moving it somewhere else, putting it down again, right? So it's a pretty clever way of representing uh, objects. Um, and then of course, after these text to image tools like Stable Diffusion came out, then there became a bunch of papers that were kind of related to, oh, I'm sorry, this, before I leave, this is like the other paper on font generation, where again, you have these kind of similar ideas where you can interpolate between fonts, you can take some representatives, uh, and then you can kind of infer what the rest of the font should look like. And just specifically for characters in a font, you can imagine there are a bunch of little nitpicky things you have to kind of make sure of, right? Which is that, you know, the, you know, the bottoms of these uh, characters line up on the baseline of the page, or that, you know, one part is not too thick, or one, or all the corners look the same, stuff like that. When you think about it, it's not that much different than a GAN that has to learn that, you know, your two eyes have to be on the same level, right? It's kind of the same thing as having the bottom of this N be the same shape. And then this is kind of like more like vector graphics conditioned on a text prompt, right? And so again, you can imagine here that under the hood, there is some um, basically like diffusion model that's going on. There's a, uh, you know, clip thing that's relating the picture to the description. And so this is a paper called Vector Fusion that came out last year, or even actually this year in CEPR. And then this is a very cool paper that just came out in this year's SIGGRAPH, which I thought was really neat, which was that, you know, if you're making like a logo for a company or something like that, the idea is that you ask the algorithm to stylize letters in the logo that match up with the sense of the word, right? So for example, you know, this pants is made up of things that look like pants, right? 
or the surfing, this S in the surfing looks like a guy who is, um, you know, surfing on the wave, and then th this N has this guy with a surfboard here. And then depending on what font you chose as your source, like this yoga font, or this yoga example, you can see that this is like the word yoga stylized in eight different fonts, and then making different choices about which of these letters should you turn into the like yoga-like thing. And so again, the user has the opportunity to see a bunch of options, decide which letters they like, and choose which one it is. So this is, like a, I think, a very clever paper that just came out in this year's SIGGRAPH. And so this was basically called like Word as Image. And so let me just write those down for the, for the record. So the first one I showed you was Vector Fusion. You have to have a cool name for your paper if you're going to publish, apparently. Um, so this is CPR 23, that's just this year. And then Word as Image was Elus et al. in this year's SIGGRAPH. And actually, now this stuff is built into um, Adobe Illustrator. So let's take a look at that. So Adobe has released a whole bunch of um, tools under kind of the generic name of Firefly. And so let's take a look at this. I tried this for the first time this morning, and it was pretty cool. So let's, let's suppose that we want to make a huge uh, hockey puck man, uh, let's see, a red and white hockey puck man with uh, arms and legs uh, saying RPI. All right. So now the wheels turn. The progress bar moves. Now here, to be honest, I don't know necessarily what's under the hood of this particular algorithm, but it is going to generate native uh, vector graphics. And actually, maybe I'm already seeing that, like, where are the, uh, <laughs> the ones I made earlier were actually better. Oh, how about this guy? <laughs> I think maybe, it, <laughs> maybe I should say hockey puck man, just to make it clear that uh, I want actually a, uh, you know, a guy. I guess you don't see the progress bar for whatever reason because of the rendering, but it is pretty fast. That's OK. You don't need to see that. Uh, OK, here we go. <laughs> RPP, uh, not bad. <laughs> yeah, how about this guy? All right, I like this guy. And so the, uh, the cool thing about this is that this is entirely um, vector graphics, right? So if I click on a piece of this, uh, let's see, I guess you can see what I'm doing here. So. If I click on a piece of this and I say ungroup, well, here you can see the little blue things all around. And I can take any part of this and I could, you know, um, like drag it around. So like if I want to just take, why can't I do this? Eh. Well, certainly you can get the idea that this is a path. I don't know why I can't like take a particular piece of this and move it around. Maybe because I haven't used Illustrator in a while. Eh. Uh, everything is still selected. Seems like every time I click something, ah, there we go. Well, so here, you, now I can see I'm starting to move this guy off of the, yeah. So all these pieces are individual pieces, right, that I could drag around. And you know, if I didn't like quite something, I could resize it, which is pretty cool, right? Um, so you can imagine that you could do this by using stable diffusion to create a raster image, a bitmap image, and then vectorizing it. Certainly, there's been a lot of work on how do I vectorize an image. But here, I can't really tell. I think this is actually doing like direct under the hood vector graphics synthesis, right? And I think this just got built into Illustrator like a few weeks ago. So it's pretty cool to be able to, to show it to you. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, so again, this is Adobe Firefly, and this is built into Illustrator uh, 2024. Um, so kind of in the same vein to uh, vector graphics is kind of like this general idea of uh, sketches, right? So if I look at, um, oops, oh, this is the uh, illustration of Firefly. So again, like I said, if you're going to print out something on a sweatshirt, you can't use a bitmap graphic. You have to have a vector graphic. Um, so there's been a lot of work on sketch type stuff. And certainly, you can imagine that, um, you know, it's not too far. As if, I mean, many people were using ControlNet on homework four, right? So you can kind of certainly get a sense of going from a sketch to a 2D object is certainly within reach. This is not ControlNet. This is a paper by Voinov et al. in this year's SIGGRAPH. 
Um, and then you could also use a sketch to get to a 3D object. We talked about 3D objects before Thanksgiving. Um, again, same kind of idea. This is a work by Sangi et al. in 2023. Um, and so kind of going from a sketch to image is one thing, but also, you know, there's been some work that's been directly in the world of sketches, right? So here's a paper by Ha and Eck from ICLR 2018, which is basically like a VAE applied to sketches, right? And so here, for example, you know, if you want to train on people's sketches of cats, like the top row of this picture, you collect lots and lots of cat sketch drawings, then you can kind of move around in the latent space, and every point in the latent space corresponds to some sketchy drawing of a cat. And the transitions are actually you know, pretty reasonable, right? So you can kind of see, for example, that the cat you know, kind of like starts to, to gain a body and a tail over as we go to the right. And then you can even kind of enable this kind of late, latent space arithmetic we talked about early on, where you take a sketch and you subtract off, you know, basically, uh, you know, like if I want to turn the cat into a cat body, first I add this pig head with a pig body, subtract the pig face, and then I end up with a cat body, right? Or vice versa. So it's kind of fun that you can actually do these kinds of things directly in, um, you know, kind of like the sketch space. And more recently, there was a very nice paper in SIGGRAPH called Clipasso, which is basically like Clip Picasso by Vinker et al. And so the idea here is, again, you try to use clip to minimize the difference between embeddings of a sketch and embeddings of a source image, right? And so this is kind of like a note that, you know, famous artists like Picasso could generate the suggestion of an image just from a few strokes, right? There was a paper we talked about a few weeks ago called Clip Draw that is kind of in the same vein as this, but this is kind of like a very nice kind of like stylized uh, stroke drawings from images. Um, and one nice thing about this paper is that they used kind of like a separate module, which is like an automatic module for estimating saliency. That is, what are the important places in the image where someone may look, and then using that to guide where the strokes should be placed. And so depending on how many strokes you have, you can, and, and there's also a bunch of other like kind of style or sketchiness parameters, you can generate, you know, like super detailed sketches of people, or you can, create like very kind of like loose, sketchy versions of people, which I think is pretty neat. And so this was one of the best papers, I believe, from SIGGRAPH uh, 2022. And then while it's not necessarily um, vector graphics per se, you know, one thing that is kind of related to this stuff is handwriting, right? So this is actually still back in the world of images, but there's been a lot of work on kind of automatic handwriting synthesis from examples. And so this was a, so the author's name is GAN, but this is also a GAN-based paper for taking a, you know, style that you try to imitate, and then you give it whatever text you want, and then you can create realistic looking handwritten, you know, text in that, in that handwriting, which is again a little bit scary when it comes to like, you know, can you believe any document that you read? You know, of course no one writes anything by hand anymore anyway, but if you were writing like a last will and testament and you can generate something that's in the author's, you know, handwriting, it looks pretty realistic, that's kind of scary. So again, this is a GAN for uh, handwriting called High GAN Plus that came out uh, this year in SIGGRAPH. Okay, so that's kind of like one prong of uh, what I wanted to talk about. Let me go back and just mention, uh, you know, a couple of things, like one, one notable thing that I mentioned was Clipasso, Thinker et al. And there are tons more papers that I've linked to on the um, course website. So let me just um, quickly flip over to uh, that. So basically here, you know, this, I, I just listed a whole bunch of papers that we kind of just went through bit by bit. And so anything that you want to learn about from today is probably on this web page. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about in a broad sense vector is, um, you know, generative models for blank is graphic layout, okay? So the next application is, um, you know, graphic layout. So again, that has to do with like if you're looking at, you know, there are a lot of things that can be thought of as layouts, right? So if you look at a magazine, you know, if you're looking at a, a two-page magazine spread, some person or maybe algorithm has made a choice to say, okay, I'm gonna have a, a banner image here and there's gonna be some text here and there's gonna be, you know, two columns of text like this and then there's gonna be a picture here and then there's gonna be, you know, text here and text here 
right? So someone is making a choice about how these kind of different blocks of content should be laid out, right? That's called layout. And so, um, you know, I know no one reads physical magazines anymore, but the same thing is true if you're thinking about a, you know, a web page, right? Like a, something on your, or, or maybe a better way to think about it is like a mobile interface on your phone, right? So when you see your phone app on Discord, you know, you have all the icons here, you have, you know, you're typing here, you've got this here. Someone had to decide how am I going to lay out these different UI elements inside the interface, right? So that's a design problem. Um, and so, again, you can think about a layout as basically a sequence of objects that have attributes. Right, so in terms of what is the input and output of the generative model, basically you have something that's like, you know, category, which could be like, you know, text box, image, or text that sits on top of an image that has a size and a position. Um, so here, you know, for a, uh, you know, an app or web page, the category could be like icon, button, text, whatever. Or for a magazine, it could be, you know, headline, image, et cetera, right? And so again, luckily there are lots of places to get training data for this, right? Like you have all the layouts of all the magazines that have been created. People have scraped basically like archive for how should a technical paper be laid out, right? So there's tons of examples of PDFs of research papers, although you could argue that since most of those papers are generated with LaTeX, that really is just like learning how LaTeX works, which we already know is an algorithm for producing good looking text, right? Um, and so this is basically, you know, uh, the, the training data. And then there's been a, a lot of uh, papers related to, you know, how do I then create kind of like a good layout based on you know, keywords, like if I'm making a spread for a wedding, maybe that's one type of style that I learned. This is the way that, you know, people like to see in magazines. Um, you know, this is kind of another example of different kinds of, uh, you know, underlying representations, right? So on the left is kind of like saying, I have these ingredients that I need to put onto the page somewhere. In the middle is the thing that the algorithm has decided to synthesize in terms of how things should be placed. And then on the right is actually the rendered version of that once you actually plug in what those things are, right? And so, you know, a lot of these pictures are not like super interesting to, to look at, um, but, uh, but again, you can kind of see here, like this is an example of like, if you're making a, this looks like a LaTeX document up here, and this looks like a mobile app, you know, like if you're looking at some sort of news site on your phone, and this looks like maybe a page for a magazine. And so the idea is you can kind of think about all these things in the same uh, kind of, um, you know, big picture way. Um, and so, again, people have applied generative models to all sorts, to all sorts of generative models to this problem, right? So again, starting from VEs and GANs, it seems like these days the most you know, high-performing models are based on transformers, just like everything else is. Um, I don't unfortunately have it on here, but uh, Adobe Firefly also has something called text to template, which is available, I believe, in a tool called Adobe Express, which is a web page. However, I think that because uh, we've got the RPI, like, campus subscription for some reason, I can't show you text to template right now, but the same thing is, uh, is applying to that, right? So suppose you go to this page, page, you say, okay, I wanna make a birthday card for my niece who loves giraffes, right? And so it makes a template, which includes a layout of, you know, where, where does the text go? Where does the picture of the giraffe go? Where does the person's name go? All that stuff. Um, and so, you know, the idea is that it enables people to make layouts intuitively. This is just kind of like a sketch that I found of what this Firefly tool does. But unfortunately, I can't show you a live demo of this right now. Now, more generally, um, this idea of layout has been applied in the computer vision world for a long time in terms of kind of like generative uh, image creation, right? So the idea is that, you know, you think about what the output of a like segmentation and classification algorithm would be from vision where it's constantly drawing boxes around cars and buildings and stuff like that. Layout, you can imagine is like the reverse of that where you say, okay, if I give you, uh, you know, a set of bounding boxes and class labels, how should you then th synthesize the result so that the things are in the right places and everything else that you didn't label is kind of harmonious, right? So the idea is that you say, okay, I want to have three zebras here and here. I want to have grass over here, sky, and then dirt. And then the result is something like this, right? So this paper um, is kind of like one of many like th computer vision type ways of thinking about layout. 
Um, and so you can imagine that this not only includes things like diffusion models, but also things like in-painting, uh, you know, kind of like image completion and things like that. Um, and you can also extend this to, well, I guess this is still a 2D example, but the idea would be to say, okay, I've got this source image and now I want to add this object, you know, find me the best place to put it that makes sense with how you've seen other things like this laid out, right? So the, the idea is that here, if I want to add another chair, it actually puts it over here. But then if I want to add like a, uh, a table, the table goes in front of this other thing. But if I want to add a plant, the plant appears to be behind this thing. So the idea is that you have kind of like a layer aware set of where these objects should be put in space. So it's not just like putting rectangles on a page, but it's kind of like a, a layered set of rectangles. So they, they each have like a Z value. And then, you know, this is a cool paper from, um, CPR this year that's called affordance aware. Uh, I don't think I don't know if they use the word layout explicitly, but the kind of clever idea is that you take a uh, a person. So on the left hand side is basically like a cropped out input person, and the upper row is a set of environments with gray blocks as they put the person there, right? And instead of just like pasting the person into the scene. The idea is that the way that you put the person in the scene should correspond to like the natural thing that person should be doing or holding, right? So for example, in this case, we see all these people from different angles, but when I put that person in front of a piano, I expect them to be kind of like standing there, you know, with their hands on the piano, right? And so even though this guy here is a full body business suit guy, over here, it's not just pasting him to the scene, but pasting him to the scene with what are called affordances, right? So uh, that's pretty clever. So you can make that person play the piano or ride a tractor, or ride a horse, or you know, transport somebody on an auto bike or walk the dog or whatever, right? So that's a pretty clever way of um, thinking about kind of like layout or in painting. Again, there's like a lot of you know underlying models here that that you know there's certainly a diffusion model going on. Another kind of not exactly the same, but related to layout is 3D stuff. So I wasn't actually, for some reason, I thought that there would be a ton of papers on this, and maybe I just didn't look hard enough. On um, You can imagine that, okay, suppose I'm a video game designer, and I want to just say, okay, make me a, you know, a dungeon with medieval stuff on the walls, and it's got to have 10 rooms, and one of them's got to be a treasure room, you know, generate, right? I'm sure there's got to be some, like, way of doing that. This is a paper from Apple. Uh, that came out in NeurIPS uh, last year, which is kind of along that line where you are creating definitely these whole environments where you can move through the environments. You can also apply some sort of like text conditioning to say, you know, go up the stairs and, you know, go through this door and so on. However, I'm pretty sure that these environments are actually like, I think they're more like nerfs than they are like, you know, mesh models of, of 3D layouts like you'd find in a video game, right? But we must be getting close to that. And maybe I just didn't look in the right place because I, I was looking mostly in like the vision and graphics literature, but maybe in like the current games developers conference, there's all sorts of stuff on generative models for like whole 3D environment creation. But still, it's, it's very easy to imagine that that's kind of where we're going, right? So kind of in the same, since we started talking about video games, the next thing to talk about is basically uh, graphic design for animation, okay? And so, or not graphic, generative models for animation. So the next kind of blank to, to fill in is animation. So, you know, how can we use generative models to create good, you know, either 2D or 3D animated characters, right? Again, possibly conditioned on text or their environments like that. You know, it's not just the same as making a video because when you're talking about animation, you know, these characters generally need to be controllable via some sort of like a underlying, you know, skeleton, right? So if you've got a, you know, person, this person has an extra joint, apparently. Okay. So, you know, you kind of want to have a model for, okay, you know, I've got like elbows and knees and neck joint and so on. So I can move all the pieces of this model around. So any, any sort of like real you know, animated, uh, you know, movie or TV show or anything like that usually has this kind of like rigged character that has this underlying skeleton and you move the joints around on the skeleton to create the animated motion of the character, right? And so um, you can talk about this in two dimensions, just like in this case, the first thing I was going to show you here, this, this Hins et al. paper from last WACV, these are definitely like kind of like 
paper cutout type of animations, right? Um, and so the way this works is, again, this was a uh, GAN, this is called character GAN, that tunes on a few sets of training images, not very much, like 10 training images, and then can produce uh, pretty realistic animations based on kind of dragging key points around. So a lot of what you do in animation is you create what are called keyframes, right? Where you say, okay, this is the pose of the character at time one, this is the pose of the character at you know, two seconds later, maybe, maybe, maybe the keyframes are closer, like one second later, now interpolate in between to make realistic looking character motion. And one thing that was kind of neat about this paper is that they kind of explicitly modeled that different parts of the character we're going to occlude other parts, right? So there's kind of like one set of uh, key points that corresponds to like the front arm and and uh, so on. But there's another set of key points that corresponds to the torso, and the third says from the arm in the back. And so you, you know that the front arm occludes the torso, and the torso occludes the the back arm, right? So you don't get kind of like you know weird clipping through artifacts. Um, and then this was a paper called. Uh, Ganimator kind of moving into 3D. So this was from SIGGRAPH uh, last year, 2022, um, by Lee et al. And I was also sure should put a shout out to my former student, Rana Hanako, who was also on this paper, uh, now a professor at University of Chicago. So again, this is something where you take an input motion, and you can imagine this input motion could come from like motion capture, for example, is an easy way to acquire you know motion. Um, and then you take a short input sequence, and from that, you use uh, GAN, basically, to create other sequences that look like they were drawn from the same distribution, but are not explicitly made up of like sticking together little mocap sequences, which is kind of like what the state of the art was before. right? So definitely, like 20 years ago, in my visual effects class, I was teaching this motion capture stuff where you kind of imagine that you could make new motions by sticking pieces of old motions together. This is much more like a GAN-based method where the stuff that's generated is truly you know, novel. Um, and so again, you can imagine that there are connections here to uh, robotics, for example, um, where you want to make like, you know, the motion of a robot is, again, one thing that I should say is that all this stuff, you know, you think about how do, you, how do you model the underlying animation? Well, it's basically like a time sequence of joint motions, right? So kind of like the, you know, representation is kind of like a time series of joint angles along basically what's called the kinematic chain. So if anyone's ever taken a robotics class, you may be familiar with this idea, where kind of what you do is you have one part of the person that's called the root, and then you work out from the root, and every uh, you know, thing here is basically specified by like uh, you know, three angles, you know, plus like probably, depending on whether it's built in or not, like an XYZ, you know, the length of this bone, basically, right? So you kind of like, how far do I travel? And then what is my, you know, kind of like angle? And then some, you know, some of these things may be slightly constrained, right? So for example, your shoulder can move in any direction that wants, if you have a good shoulder, but your elbow can only move like a hinge, right? So there may be some constraints on what type of joint you have at each of these balls, right? Um, and so again, this is the same way that you'd represent the end effector of a robot, right, where you have like the root of the robot, then you've got like one robot arm piece, one other robot arm piece. So it's all kind of like the same kind of idea. Um, and so in this case also, especially in an application like this, if you're actually really concerned about um, how something is moving on a ground plane, you have to have some further constraints or pay attention paid to the fact that you know, when the foot contacts the floor, it has to look natural, right? You can't have like someone's foot that goes through the floor or seems to hover above the floor. And so here there's no like physics involved, but still there's attention paid to making sure that when this guy is dancing around, that doesn't look like his foot is naturally moving off of the floor. So, um, but let me just also say that like not every problem has to be solved with generative models, right? So this is a generative approach to motion generation looks pretty good, but you know, this is a generative, I'm sorry, this is not a generative model. This is a paper from SIGGRAPH this year that uses a much more, um, you know, like articulated skeleton, right? So instead of having just like, you know, uh, maybe two dozen joints in a human skeleton, this object has 443 joints because of like 
the hair is articulated and the skirt is articulated. And this is a non-generative model, right? So this is basically, you know, using a different kind of way of thinking about how do I synthesize these new motions. There's a concept, again, that, that is fairly old called bidirectional similarity that I talk about in my visual effects class, where these new models, these new motions are created so that everything that is in one of these new motions can be found in one of the old motions and vice versa. So there's no like extra stuff, but it is something where you're kind of creating these new uh, animations from whole cloth instead of like cutting and pasting. So I just want to say that like not everything has to be generative. It seems like these days that's what everyone is doing. But here's a great example of a, of a nice motion synthesis work that is not like generative AI at all. And of course, then once Clip came on the scene, you were able to generate like, you know, text conditioned motion, right? So here, this is a paper uh, called Clip Actor from ECCV 2022, where you specify a prompt that includes basically both a kind of a, a noun and a verb, right? So you specify Freddie Mercury dancing or Gordon Ramsay stirring food. And then there's kind of like, in a way, you're decoupling what we might think of as like style and appearance, right? So appearance is, you know, Gordon Ramsay and style is stirring food. And so the way some of these algorithms work is kind of like first you generate kind of like a generic mesh that corresponds to the desired motion. And then you deform that mesh and texture it to correspond to the image of the thing that you want, right? The appearance of the thing that you want, right? So this is kind of like supposedly, you know, better than something like we talked about last time, this uh, Dreamforge algorithm, right? So Dreamforge or dream fields, I'm sorry, dream fields was an algorithm for creating these kind of like little, you know, cute generative 3D objects, you know, they were a little bit less detailed than this, and they probably weren't quite as, you know, specific to the person here. Here's another example from uh, SIGGRAPH last year, where you specify again, a kind of a shape of an object, right? So here we have, like in blue text is kind of like how you want the object to look in yellow text is the thing that you want to create. And in red text is the motion that you want them to be doing, right? And so this again kind of like decouples the, uh, you know, the shape and the appearance part from the motion part. So probably typically what happens is that you first create the, you know, kind of motion on some sort of generic mesh template. Then you make that mesh and you texture it to correspond to the text prompt. And so you can again, this is a paper called Avatar Clip. And so you can imagine that Clip is involved here in terms of making sure that the images that you generate as part of the animation sequence all correspond to the, the text prompt, right? Um, so a particular kind of uh, animation involves gestures, right? So, um, you know, animation in general is just like, okay, I want this character to move across the screen. But, you know, one thing that we as humans do is gesture, right? And so um, just kind of like, this is an example of kind of what's called co-speech gesturing, where the input is a bunch of things, right? So you notice that when I'm lecturing, right, I'm constantly moving my arms around, right? And so some of that is conscious and some of that is subconscious. And that gesture motion will depend a lot on, you know, what I'm saying, like the words that I'm saying, the emphasis I want to give certain words. It will depend on how excited I am or if I'm like happy or sad or pissed off or anything like that. That will kind of change the way that I gesture, right? And so here, this is um, a paper by Ao et al. from this year's SIGGRAPH where it's called gesture diffu clip. So it's got a bunch of stuff stuck together, right? So the input is basically, you know, you've got a transcript of kind of like what you want to follow along with. You maybe have the audio that kind of corresponds to how that audio is being said. And then you've got kind of like a uh, conditioning, like excited, right? And so here, I'm not sure the sound will play, but this is an example of like, you know, I am very happy when people I guess you get to hear the sound photo, because I don't have it turned up. My this is my, this is my audio problem with uh, OBS. But basically, you know, here, when the guy is like, you know, this family photo, and you see the guy points with his right hand to the family photo, photo but, but then my grandmother my passed grandmother away, and he kind of like puts his head down and, and waves his arm like this. So kind of like what's, what's happening here is you can think of it as a kind of animation, but it's kind of tied to the human body, and it's tied to the sentiment and the content of the text that's being spoken, right? Um, and so again, this is kind of under the hood, there's, there's a clip thing, and there's also kind of like a contrastive model for understanding how should gestures match up with transcripts, right? So kind of like in the same way that clip tries to embed 
the image and the text into the space that where those two things are close, you can imagine the same kind of thing where you try to embed, like, is this gesture harmonious with this transcript, right? So it's like, my grandmother died. You know, that's not like a good way to put that together. You want to kind of like separate that out so you have like harmonious gestures. And so you can imagine some sort of contrasting learning framework that would make that work. Um, and then here's another paper from SIGGRAPH this year. On the right-hand side is the same kind of idea. Uh, there is no sound in this video, but you know, to co-speech gesturing, where you've got somebody who is basically you know, being animated to correspond to some sort of recorded video. On the left is kind of like using the very same underlying algorithm to take music and synchronize this person's dancing to the music, right? And so um, let me see if I can find, I'm not sure where this will work very well without the sound, but um, so this is this, listen, denoise, action. Um, and I don't know. So here you can see kind of like they have all sorts of, uh, we have to wait for this to load for a second. They have all sorts of input data with kind of labeled uh, motions in different, uh, you know, types. So there's like, you know, you've got a chicken dance, the dinosaurs. So there's lots of input data that they collected. Um, you know, again, some massive transformer architecture. Um, and like I said, I think this is a failing of my, uh, yeah, unfortunately I can't give you the sound. But you can play it, you can play with it on your own. So here is like locking, right? Which is kind of like this very rigid kind of, uh, dance. And this is jazz. So you can see that you specify the style and then the circle with the thing is kind of like an indication of like the beat of the music. Now, there's been so much work on um, all sorts of, uh, you know, human motion synthesis that, you know, to go into it all would be, would be a lot. And this is, I guess, just a, a, a gesture-based um, like, thing, where again, this is kind of like more like the generic mesh like that, that is trying to generate gestures like that arms. match up with did some corresponding that? speech. Just like um, so it's kind of cool of that this one model can, can do all this stuff at the same time. So it's called Listen, Denoise, Action. Um, and then this was the paper that I was showing earlier, this generative model for um, gesturing. Oh, wait, is this the same thing? Let me just see what we're going to look at here. Gen MM. Oh, no, this was, this was the wrong thing. Sorry, never mind. This one, Gesture Deep Deep Foot. So again, in, in a paper, it's difficult to illustrate the gestures that are being created, right? So here you see that as it slowly loads, you see the sky, you know, like with these arrows that indicate what's going on. Um, and here you can kind of see, again, the idea behind, you know, you've got a text prompt that is encoded by a clip. You've got audio features and text transcripts that go into this diffusion model. And the output is kind of like these stylized gestures. Um, so again, you can load this up on your own and play around with it. Okay, so um, what else do I want to say here? So one thing I want to say kind of in passing is that there is kind of a subculture of, um, you know, work in computer vision and computer graphics related to fashion, right? And so here are a couple papers from recent SIGGRAPHs where, again, you can imagine how CLIP is involved here also and diffusion models where you kind of take an input image and you supply both a text prompt and some fabric samples and then you create a kind of virtual 3D try-on, or no, actually, this is, this is just 2D, but a virtual try-on of what would I look like in this outfit, right? So people have been talking about this application for a long time where you kind of like want to envision before you buy this thing, how will it look on me, right? And so you supply the picture of yourself and you supply, you know, some sort of description and then it makes pretty realistic looking uh, clothing. Um, and this paper I thought was pretty cool. Again, this is like a fairly niche paper, but the idea is that you take a 3D point cloud as input, and then in some sense, the underlying representation, which is the way that the clothing is actually made, is a set of basically 2D cutouts of cloth and instructions for sewing them together. So you can basically take the point cloud as input, and the output is something that you could actually fabricate into something that looks like the thing that you scanned, right? And so this is like, you know, a generative model for uh, fashion or for clothing design, clothing synthesis, which is pretty neat. And then the last thing I want to talk about, just to kind of bring things uh, full circle, 
is there was a cool paper in SIGGRAPH this year called Diffusion Image Analogies by Subtrova et al. And so this paper, I'm sorry, Sub, Subtrova, sorry. Uh, this paper took that image analogies, which was one of the very first pre-deep learning algorithms we talked about back in August, and applies it to the kind of like diffusion age, right? So the idea is that you supply two images, A and A prime, and you, and you supply a new image B, you say, now I want you to make me a B prime that is related to B in the same way that A prime is related to A, right? We saw that worked at kind of like the pixel scale back in the day, and you could use this to make things that look like they had been painted in the style of Van Gogh and whatnot. But here, this is like almost a, you know, this is not a pixel to pixel correspondence now. It's like saying, okay, you know, this cat is to this dog as these three cats are to this, right? So it makes basically three dogs, right? And the, the idea is that you don't actually give any sort of text supervision to this at all. You just kind of show it these images and it figures out what to do, right? Uh, and so you can say, okay, here is this woman in a yoga pose. Here is this metal Buddha. Now here's these people to yoga class and it makes them into this kind of class full of Buddhas, right? So I thought that was kind of like a clever way of kind of like bringing that image analogies idea into the kind of deep learning, or not deep learning, the diffusion model era, right? So yes, so I kind of blazed through my, my lecture notes because I wasn't really writing any equations down, right? I was just kind of like showing you a bunch of things. So you can kind of see how, you know, diffusion models, clip, all these things have kind of like come together to make generative applications in all sorts of different domains. I think the key thing that you have to just be aware of is you know, how do I model the input the right way, right? So to model an animation, it's kind of like this joint angle expression. To model a graphic layout, it's a set of bounding boxes in XY locations. To model vector graphics, it's a bunch of kind of like B-spline directions. But then once you've got the underlying representation and you find the right loss function, you can use the same kinds of ideas, VAE, GAN, transformers, diffusion models, to generate things that appear to be drawn from the same distribution of the input, which is the whole point of what generative modeling is, right? So. That's kind of like the, the last thing that I, that I have to, to show you. Um, any comments or questions? Any applications of generative models that you've seen that I haven't come up with? I know that one thing that I didn't talk about here, which is, um, you know, uh, let me just write down. So what did we talk about? We talked about uh, animation. We talked about, you know, fashion. We talked about gesture. Dot, 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 you know. Like I said, I think that there's gotta be something on like kind of 3D game environments, which is not exactly the same as, you know, a Nerf model. Certainly there's been a lot of work on kind of like medical uh, imaging. So I know that, um, you know, a couple of papers that came through the graduate level uh, paper reactions were on medical imaging. Alyssa, I think you, you had a couple, right? So basically, you know, you could apply this to x-rays or CT scans, right? Of course, you have to be very careful that you don't generate, you know, CAT scans of patients that would lead you to make bad surgical decisions, something like that. But certainly, you could apply this to any kinds of images, right? Um, yeah, so and certainly in our biomedical engineering department, I know they're using a lot of generative models for all sorts of, you know, like different modalities and different problems. Um, what else have I forgotten in terms of things that you could apply generative models to? I know, I tried to find a, yes. Yeah. So about games. Yeah. You know of a game environment uh, application? Yeah. So you look up opus, O-P-U-S dot AI. OK, opus dot AI. Type and play, OK. <laughs> is this not what I want? Well, it turns text into simulations and worlds. Well, I guess this is kind of like th this, how it works. Oh, this is like one of those things where I scroll down and it scrolls to the side. What is up with this? Well, actually, this is one thing. Actually, this is one of your projects. Right? So like one of the um, applications is storytelling, right? So you kind of like are going to have like kind of going from a text prompt to an illustrated story, right? Which is kind of like text and image. But this is a little bit more advanced it seems like lighting camera control terrain I think they have a video. they have a video watch the demo how about that I gotta say I'm not excited about this web page oh okay yes so in case you can't read this this basically is saying you know it's like you know 
The hills rolled down in stepping motion covered with greenery. Clusters of trees surrounded areas with the rest, covered with falling leaves. Recently built road abruptly came to a halt. Left branch, a detached garage, small house with matching roofs. So basically, I guess as you're typing, it's generating this whole 3D world. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. If this was Unity or Unreal, it's Unreal. This is Unreal, okay. Huh. It's a little bit hard to, like, <laughs> they have, like, the autocomplete on, so basically, uh, as they type in, it's creating this stuff. That's crazy. Oh, wow. So I guess you're changing both the texture and the lighting, right? It was a small road. It continued on the other side that crossed the main road, forming an intersection with wet patches from the rain. <laughs> A dense cluster of buildings forming the business district. It's like I'm narrating and it's creating my story. Huh. It's pretty cool. So they can also do like animate like characters. Yeah, let's see if there if further on there are like animated characters here. Let's scroll forward a little bit. Wow. Well wow, the trees are waving. That's kind of like a little bit of animation. Oh wow, yeah. So this is basically saying, a girl stood close to the entrance. After a while, she exited the hedge and paced across the side street, heading to the main street. Yeah, so it's really hard to tell like, how much of this is truly generated. Like, uh, certainly, the, clearly, the, the building stuff is being generated. But like, I don't know. Like, I, think it's like just I think it's layouts, yeah. It's yeah, you can think about it as like, a layout problem, exactly, right? Um, and then. I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say, like, once you've got the layout, you know that these are the navigable areas. You can generate, like, the kind of, like, navigation graph for these characters to move along. So it doesn't necessarily have to navigate. It doesn't have to generate this character motion from total scratch, right? Like, it knows about, like, walk cycles and stuff like that, probably, I would imagine. But, yeah, that's pretty slick. Just to see it done in real time like that is pretty cool. Is that another, another hand, or are you just... Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the tip. That's a good one. So this is opus.ai. Yeah, cool. Um, and then I guess the question is like, once you have this, like, then I guess you can just save it as a, as a model. That's pretty cool. I have to say though, I just disapprove of this uh, way of scrolling right and left. Gamers, uh, huh? Let's ask for the facts. Uh, it's pretty vague. Cool. All right, other questions or comments? Yes? Could you make one for cooking recipes? Recipes, yeah, I think so. I mean, like, you could make a, you could make a recipe-based GPT already, right? Like the, the wine example, the wine reviews example is kind of like that. I think there actually is a, like, a, like a Kaggle recipe data set that then you could just basically generate recipes um, that was actually one of the first things there were people doing with, with ChatGPT was saying, okay, I've got these ingredients. Could you tell me something to make? Or make me a recipe for a pizza, you know, that has mushrooms. Like, yeah. ChatGPT, I mean, the recipe, it knows it's made from training data. Yeah. So what if you have training data that's the same, I don't know, flavor profiles? Oh, I see. So the recipes are not, like, just text prompts, but, or, but they're actually based on like understanding how things should fit together, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it all comes down to where you get the training data from, right? And how you represent the cost function that you need to train a network like that, right? Uh, and, and then of course you need to have sorry, evaluation criteria, right? So that's one thing I didn't talk about is just like, you know, for all this stuff, you not only need to have data representation, loss function, but then you also have to have some sort of evaluation metric, right? And so for a, you know, layout, right? Like there may not necessarily be a, a right answer. You may have to do some sort of human studies, right? So especially for something like, um, you know, uh, animation, right? So it's probably very difficult to have a quantitative score for how good an animation is. You have to probably ask a user panel and do a, a very carefully constructed subjective user study for which of these things do you prefer, right? Um, and for a recipe, right, you'd have to kind of like do the same thing, right? You have to somehow have people taste these weird things and score them, right, in order to help the, the algorithm get better, right? Yeah. 
All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording then.